Greetings, cherished members of the Mighty Imaging Special Interest Group, and a special welcome to all our wonderful colleagues from the AOPT and the APTA. Thanks for joining us in our collective efforts to dismantle the barriers that keep us from actualizing our ultimate macro picture goal of autonomous primary care physical therapy practice. And that for us in our echo chamber means realizing and normalizing physical therapist imaging referral privileges and PT administered ultrasound imaging. I'm Bruno Steiner. I'm the current president of the Imaging Special Interest Group for the APT's Academy of Orthopedic Physical Therapy. Tonight, we are mind-blowingly lucky to welcome a panel of powerhouse physical therapy researchers to whom we are all indebted for their ongoing scientific contributions. Doctors Aaron Kyle, Stephen Correa, Kelly Clark, Evan Nelson, Scout Toffiner, and Brian Barney have granted us a privileged first look at some seriously impactful data as they present and discuss ordering of diagnostic imaging by physical therapists, a multi-center analysis of successful implementation. Uh so excited by this additional supportive evidence and I can't wait to hear from all our colleagues and dig into the discourse. But as usual, I've got to get through some business items from our, for our imaging SIG members and review our nation's imaging scorecard. Uh, we've got some interesting developments that I'm certain you're going to enjoy. Uh, before we get to our panelists. So onward, leading off, let's talk about the Mighty Imaging SIG membership meetings. Reminding everyone about our 2024 Ver uh, Vernal Equinox meeting last month with Dr. Lance Mabry from High Point University in North Carolina. We got real granular into his most recent observational study, physical therapist, awareness of diagnostic imaging referral jurisdictional scope of practice. And given Lance's entrenched involvement in physical therapy advocacy, we got deep into the brass knuckles tactics used by rival stakeholding adversaries in the horse trading game of politics. Confirmed from May 23rd at 6 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, we've got the legendary Dr. Tim Flynn, who's presenting Imaging Health, the physical therapist's role in disrupting our sickness model. I can't wait to see his take on PT-directed imaging referral in Colorado and the cost savings PTs bring to public health when we're integrated as primary care practitioners. And fair warning, I'm probably going to pause the meetings uh, this summer until September to give everyone a break, but fear not, uh, we'll keep you informed when we hear of new developments. Already we have speakers and research that will be presented in the fall, so stay tuned for that. And anytime you have any data or any sort of evidence and you want to bring it, please bring it to the show. We'd love to hear it. Uh, you're, you have an anxious audience for your research. So if you want to check out previous membership meeting recordings, just navigate to our Imaging Special Interest Group page on the AOPT website, not the APTA website, uh, two different animals. Uh, just scroll down to the very bottom of the page and you'll find the ISIG membership webinars and click your way to the valuable insights of our speakers. Also, you might want to check out our AOPT YouTube channel for all kinds of AOPT content, including our membership meetings. And I've got to tell you, we are certainly getting a lot of views. This mainly because imaging referral and PT administered ultrasound imaging are so important and transformational to autonomous primary care practice for our professional relevance for expedient, modern quality patient care. Uh, I'll just remind you that I'm available to take all your questions offline if you want to discuss strategic planning for your individual states. And that's how you should look at us at the ISIG, your rapid response resource. Don't plan it alone. Uh, and reinvent a faultier wheel, please contact us as you trailblaze forward in your respective states. Not all approaches have to be a complicated max effort of a legislative approach. So please talk to us. Uh, so where are we with imaging referral privileges? Oh, well, I'm going to do a quick rundown of the nationwide scorecard. And on the heels of that, I've got some exciting fresh news for you, uh, even for you, Dr. Kyle. Uh, and one more important disclosure, Dr. Lance Mabry and I continue to col collaborate to compile and refresh this list. So in dark green, we can order everything. In light green, we can only order radiography. Uh, but like I said, this picture is going to change uh, in a very short order. Uh, so there's a real appetite for the full realization of imaging referral. I think people are getting it and how important it is. Uh, in gray, we have practice acts that, that are largely neutral and silent with effectively no prohibitions to imaging referral. What does that mean? Well, no one's going to stop you from imaging referral. You might have to talk with some radiology practices and centers uh, if they have questions and find it novel to get a referral from a PT. Um, 
But really, uh, this has been a successful approach for many PTs. And if you don't believe me, check out our November 2023 uh, 2023 ISIG membership meeting with Colorado's Scott Rezac, who showed us how he managed this. It turns out that imaging referral in a, sil in a state that's got a silent practice act is really a bit of a nothing burger, especially for those practicing independent practice. And even though the issue seems to generate some real insecurity in some of our colleagues, they needn't be. Uh, in red on the map, most alarmingly, um, these states have in red are exp have explicit language against PT directed uh, imaging. Uh, these are real setbacks. They're even punitive in language. Uh, it's it's uh, really disturbing. Uh, these states are going to need tough legislative battles to make any gains moving forward. And once again, I'm going to express my concern about the decision makers who got us to this point, and who might be frankly out of step with current realities of physical therapy, uh, our profession, and our education. And plainly speaking, I'm concerned that they actually might be inadvertently or purposefully hamstringing our ability to serve our public's interest in the face of physician and nursing shortages. So um, I'm going to state unequivocally that I think the time's come for our deliberative bodies to reflect our professional realities, and we should be paying more attention to this and making appropriate changes and selections to our state board members as we move forward. And also, 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 uh, I told you I was going to talk about this. Uh, there are plenty of our participants who are watching this webcast who should really consider putting their name into the hat for state board member positions. A lot of you are more than qualified to fulfill this role in your states and represent the public's interest. I've begun goading people into this and I'm already getting bites. Uh, these member positions are max impact roles. We need to do more of this. I need to do this in my state as well. Uh, let's see if I can put my money where my mouth is. So, and of course, let's not forget military branches. Military has proven no, uh, has, have no such uh, prohibitions to imaging referral and have proven the efficacy of PT-directed imaging referral since the 1970s. And this is what we want to emulate in all federal, state, law, opinions, and rulings. <laughs> Uh, one thing about the um, the Silent Practice Acts uh, in gray, as we went through just a couple of screens ago, you're not allowed to order for Medicare patients or Medicaid patients. That's the only snafu when it comes to that. So that's a time for uh, that we can discuss at some point in the future. But at this point, I'm going to... Um, I'm gonna stop teasing and concealing exciting developments and let you in on some stuff that's been happening in real time. We've got some great unfolding stories and real potential additions to the win column on the nationwide scorecard. Uh, Alaska, Nevada, Arizona. Yes, Arizona and Colorado are looking really good right now. And there's deepening interest in seven, potentially eight states that I'm talking with uh, but I've been sworn to secrecy on. They don't want to. They don't want to re reveal their hand. Um, uh, but here's what I can talk to you about. And I know Colorado. Why am I putting Colorado? They've already got full imaging access. But there's something special going on in Colorado that we have to go through. But let's first off talk about Alaska. Uh, APT Alaska Imaging Group Chair and AOPT Imaging Sig Alaska li Liaison Dr. Jeff Gordon initiated a super Alaska state PT board inquiry modeled after Dr. Aaron Kyle, who is with us tonight. Um, he, uh, 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 Dr. Uh, Gordon actually calibrated a, a state board question to elicit a favorable response. And the short answer is that the Alaska state board confirmed that physical therapists have a duty to refer as, to a qualified provider when the patient's care is beyond the expertise of the physical therapist that a radiologist is a qualified provider, <laughs> that ordering imaging is not prohibited, and that the, the Röntgen language did not prohibit PTs from ordering radiography, etc. And this all based on the FSBPT language and other precedent elucidated by our professional bodies and the military, physical therapists can order imaging. These are the recommendations by the state board. Now they have to go through an additional hoop. They have to go to their Alaska administrative code. So they implicit, they explicitly write, they support administrative changes to include PTs as referring providers for imaging in the Alaska administrative code. So we still have a couple of hoops, uh, but this is still great news. And it doesn't mean we necessarily have to go through a legislative process. So Jeff is looking into this. I'm looking into this. So let's see where this goes. Um, and I got to tell you, um, Jeff's inquiry was reviewed legally by the same people who work with the AAC 
and the board verbatim adopted the language crafted by Jeff. And it, the anatomy of his inquiry document is really fantastic. It really builds on uh, Dr. Kyle's work and Dr. Dauber's work, James Dauber. And um, he collaborated intensely with us. And uh, we're so glad to have been a part of this. Uh, so, uh, you know, I got to tell you, this was, is something to study. I'm really proud to say that also um, um, <laughs> we got quoted, our little uh, resource guide, it's not so little actually, it's pretty extensive. We got cited in both the inquiry and the response documents, but ultimately Jeff Gordon heroically executed this and brought this to, to the board, both orally and in document. Bravo, Jeff, amazing accomplishment. Here's that uh, finished robust document, uh, which will be cir circulated to all members for of our nationwide state boards with all the current evidence. Uh, the document essentially provides answers to hot button issues in a one-stop shop of background evidence and institutional support for PT administered imaging referral and even ultrasound imaging in the hands of the physical therapists. And we'll be distributing this through the ICIG and through the APT governmental affairs uh, to state board members, as well as individual APT state chapter leaders across the nation. And I remind people that this is actually a living document so as soon as new evidence comes in, we're going to be putting it in. So very much this evidence uh, that we're going to hear tonight will be part of this document. So similarly, moving on to the next state, um, we use this document for the Nevada Physical Therapy State Board. So APTA Nevada's brilliant president, Dr. Susan Priestman, Priestman had coordinated with us to bring a timely and frankly well-timed inquiry to the Nevada State Board with a similarly crafted model question, including the same context, professional organizational precedent, coupled with some modifications tweaked to Nevada's practice silent, uh, Nevada's Silent Practice Act. And we have very, very good reason to believe that this will be a positive outcome as we believe the board member who is working on this response sees the clear and present need to acknowledge our skill sets in the context of the public's great need for our services. And Susan, are, Susan and I are like cats at a, watching at a mouse hole for the response. But I think this is a really strong document, strong question, and it'll pass muster legally as well. Well, what about Arizona? Uh, you might recall that we uh, we had then APTA Arizona President Brian Schmitz recount how Arizona got scuttled during a legislative in initiative by one ER physician who couldn't see allowing us MRI referral and only permitting radiography. Uh, resulting in, in Arizona PTs acquiescing to radiography referrals only. Uh, but I don't think that ever sat well with doc, Dr. Brian Schmidt. So the, the Arizona PT struck again, seizing an opportunity, knowing that this ER physician no longer ran for the Health and Human Services Committee. So as a result, Dr. Schmidt's reports that Arizona is on the verge of full imaging referral pr privileges. Arizona S Senate Bill 1267 passed unanimously through the Senate Health Committee and floor vote. It passed through the House Committee 6-2 to two and now waits the floor, but optimism is super high, and we see no realistic opposition despite the boilerplate shrieking from some, no offense men, uh, out of touch and uniformly uninformed howlers. You can imagine who I might be referring to. Uh, so Arizona shows that we need to keep our eye on the ball for any political opening. And uh, speaking of taking advantage of opportunities, uh, let's talk Colorado. Um, I was briefed by Colorado APT Secretary and Co-Chair of Government Affairs, Dr. Chris Edmondson, about developments in Colorado. Um, we know they already have full uh, imaging access, so why are we doing this? But uh, fate, as fate would have it, Colorado has to go through. It's required an unavoidable periodic sunset review to praise the continued existence and administrative and administration of the PT profession in Colorado. Sounds frightening. Um, but the uh, powerful Rocky Mountain PTs are using this opportunity to modernize their practice act to most relevantly to us, uh, formally incorporate standard methods and techniques to obtain data about patient or client, including diagnostic imaging and electrodiagnostic and electrophysiological tests and measures. I love the language here. It's simple and it's broad. And also, this is kind of fun. Uh, Colorado physical therapists want to protect physical therapy professions branding. And I have to say branding is important. So I want to speak to that a little, maybe later in an uh, other membership meeting. Um, apparently it's, it's really kind of funny. There are these dynamic 
uh, personal trainers that want to co-op the term DBT and um, and other shenanigans, but uh, we could spend half an hour on that easily. But finally, what really raised the fireworks in this legis in this quasi legislative session or committee session was we're we're trying to get uh, to prescribe uh, durable medical equipment uh, to patients without requesting a prescription from a licensed physician. And this essentially was the uh, <laughs> was the controversial subject and it required, it, it did result in some saber la rattling and uh, an orthopedic surgeon that essentially was throwing really completely evidence-free anecdotal uh, arguments to why we shouldn't be getting this right. But I got to tell you, physical therapists um, led by Tim, Tam, Tamara uh, Strussel and Chris Edmondson, they just went to town on this guy. Uh, they just didn't allow anything to go by. They argued the evidence, and um, it was really impressive. Unafraid, unapologetic, not bullying, but just they stood their ground. And we could learn so much from this. So that's why I put the, the actual web address here. So take a screenshot, get onto it. You're going to have the anatomy of how you fight off the boilerplate crap that we've been dealing with for years. And this is the, it's, it, you know, it's kind of a lazy strategy that they employ um to to try to scuttle our efforts at better care for our patients but you really got to you got to listen to this even though it's not totally uh imaging related but it tells you the anatomy of the fight so at uh here we go but now to the main event uh so where i can actually stop droning on relentlessly so happy to introduce doctors aaron kyle <laughs> Stephen correa kelly clark evan nelson Brian Barney and Scott Taufener. I think we got to mute one of you guys here. Uh, all right. And so get your questions out for our panelists and let's dig into the science and of course, reflect on the possibilities ahead. Uh, to introduce our panelists, I could go on and on about our guests' powerful research credentials, but I'm trying to move this along. First off, we have panelists from Georgetown. We have Dr. Aaron Kyle. He's a clinical professor at the University of Illinois at Chicago, where he teaches diagnostic imaging in the Doctor of Physical Therapy program. He also serves as the director of Orthopedic Physical Therapy Residency Program and the UIC faculty practice. You know him as a prolific researcher and prominent speaker at national conferences on topics of direct access and diagnostic imaging. He also provides guidance to institutions across the country pursuing these initiatives. And I'll tell you what, he's a huge pillar to me He's always there to consult. This guy is just a godsend uh, to all of us uh, wanting to improve our, our profession and also serve our public. Uh, also from Georgetown, Dr. Kelly Clark is a published clinical leader and physical therapist at MedStar Georgetown University Hospital where she specializes in orthopedics. Dr. Clark is a board certified orthopedic clinical specialist. Dr. Brian Barony uh, currently serves as the program coordinator for the orthopedic physical therapy residency program while providing patient care at the faculty practice and teaching DPT and undergraduate programs. From St. Luke's, we have the impeccably credentialed researcher, Dr. Stephen Correa, who is the director of orthopedic physical therapy residency and the director of the spine physical therapy fellowship program for St. Luke's University Health Network and assistant professor that he is clinical associate in the department of physical therapy at the sales university PA. From the University of Wisconsin, no stranger to us on this uh, on these membership meetings, uh, another research powerhouse, Dr. Evan Nelson, is an assistant professor in the DPT program and Department of Family Medicine and Community Health at the University of Wisconsin Madison. He's specifically trained in translational clinical research, and his research has led to numerous publications and presentations on diagnostic imaging clinical practice. And we are very fortunate to have expert clinician, physical therapist, Scott Toffiner, who's at University of Wisconsin, his hospital and clinics in Madison, Wisconsin. He's a spine special, physical therapy specialist and mentors and instructs in orthopedic residency, direct access, patient care, spinal manipulation, and interdisciplinary care collaboration with an important emphasis on proper imaging referral. Fellow researchers and dear friends, I thank you in advance for sharing your data with us this evening. I'm gonna unshare, I'm gonna take a breath and I believe Dr. Kyle will start this off and take it from here. Let's get into this. Are you ready, Dr. Kyle? Let's do it. <clears throat> Thank you, Bruno, for the opportunity. 
Uh, I am struggling with a little bit of a cold, so my apologies in advance for having to listen to how I sound, but uh, we'll get through it. <clears throat> um, as Bruno mentioned, here's our team. These guys are the, the brains behind this project. Um, and I want to just really thank um, uh, our prior imaging SIG president uh, for, for kicking us in the butt to get this project going. Th this was something in the works for probably two years or so. And uh, he just kept after it and kept after it, uh, Dr. Chuck Hazel, and uh, finally got us, you know, to the point where we could, we could uh, move forward. So thank you, Chuck. <clears throat> I want to start our time tonight with with uh, hearkening back to uh, last fall or summer, September 2023. Many of you were a part of the Imaging SIG uh, presentation that month with Dr. Corey Zibney. And uh, in his story of getting um, imaging privileges <clears throat> in Iowa, he mentioned uh, one of the roadblocks. And I think it's relevant to our story about our project. And so I want to start with that. Um, this is a letter that was written to Senator Mark Costello, who's apparently the chair of the Joint Subcommittee on Health and Human Services in uh, Iowa. This is from the American College of Radiology. Okay, we, we cite the ACR in positive ways all the time for good reason. Here's what it says. On behalf of the American College of Radiology, we appreciate the opportunity to comment and oppose, oppose SSB 1046. This was the bill that seeks to permit the referral of a patient by a PT for diagnostic imaging. So this is kind of a big roadblock. If, if I would to pick all of the people or organizations that I wouldn't want against me, this might be number one. Like they, the ACR leadership saying, we don't think this is a good idea or any physical therapist, like the profession. They, they came out to, and said that, which is kind of a big deal. Now we know the end of the story, Corey and his team were eventually successful, but this, this can stop people in their tracks. Uh, they further went on in the letter to say, we believe expanding <clears throat> the scope, uh, the scope of physical therapists to include diagnostic imaging would be burdensome to the overall impact on healthcare costs in Iowa and may result in repeat exams with potential exposure to repeated radiation doses. So, all right, they're, they're giving the reason behind, uh, you're gonna order too much stuff. This is gonna break down Iowa's healthcare system. These are some pretty lofty accusations, I would say, in print. And then they go on to cite this study. Okay. Well, they're citing something, that's good. Because sometimes you, you read these things and you go, well, it's just <laughs> hot air. Show me the data. Why do you believe that this is such a bad idea? They cite a JAMA article. <clears throat> JAMA is known all over the world, of course. And, and you feel like, well, maybe, maybe this study shows clearly that PT shouldn't be doing this. The, the head of the ACR is citing this study they said it's a recent study. The study must clearly demonstrate that PTs should not be doing this because why would the head of the ACR ever in writing refer to this study if it wasn't doing exactly that? Just as a reminder, this was the chief executive officer representing 40,000 radiologists saying PTs should not do this. So this is really heavy. And kudos to Corey and his team for just moving forward and still getting imaging privileges. Here's the study. Maybe you've read it, maybe you haven't. A comparison of diagnostic imaging ordering patterns between advanced practice clinicians. That must be us, right? It doesn't say physical therapists, but hey, they're citing this study to say PT shouldn't do this. That This study must have included physical therapists for sure. They said it was a recent study. I don't know if eight years old is, is super recent. Uh, you know, that's debatable, but I would say maybe not so recent. Um, there are other articles that have been published since January of 2015 that uh, are more recent, we'll say. So, and just here's my disclaimer about this study. So we're not going to review the whole thing, but here it is. No data 
related to physical therapy practice was included in this study at all. And yeah, I wish I was joking, but I'm not. Uh, that's it. In fact, the words physical therapists were not used at all. Physical therapy practice, there, I read the study word for word. There's no reference to our profession at all. None. Okay, well, that, that's a different, a different take on if you're going to cite the study that says PT shouldn't be doing this, maybe add a sentence in your paper or in, in your you know editorial about this didn't really cover PT practice at all, but we think it might apply still. Say that, at least. They didn't say that, which I think is a miss. Here's the conclusions uh, that they came up with. Advanced practice clinicians are associated with more imaging services than PCPs. All right, so we know they're not talking about physical therapists, but if they're talking about nurse practitioners and PAs and whatever, maybe you could make the case that if all of those folks got it wrong or they order way too much stuff, you, you could make the case that perhaps others yeah. shouldn't be ordering either. I disagree with that uh, assumption, but let's just give it some credibility for the sake of argument. So they say people that aren't MDs, they don't know how to do it right. They, they order too much. Okay, got it. If it's in JAMA, you got to think this is this is a problem, right? Maybe they order 50% more, 70% more. They, they have to be out of their mind ordering more studies than, than the regular MDs. Here's the results. Advanced practice clinicians were associated with more imaging than PCPs. Got it. How much more? 0.3% more. This is the, um, <clears throat> the efforts to say this is a huge problem. It's so big, it's 0.3% more imaging studies by APCs. Okay, well, maybe, maybe advanced imaging was the problem, right? Who cares about x-rays, maybe MRIs and CTs and all these things. For advanced imaging, it was 0.1% more MRIs and CT scans. 0.1. <laughs> I just... I, I'm not great with stats, but when I read that, I think I, this doesn't sound like a problem to me. Okay, so we got, it didn't even cover PTs, number one. So just, that's a, that's a big problem. That's the biggest problem. Is this really an issue? Like 0.1% of nurse practitioners, you know, are ordering, this is ridiculous to me that it's, it doesn't seem like it even, it's even a problem at all. And in their conclusions, they, they do say, well, increased use of imaging appears modest. I like how you couch that. Yeah, modest, 0.1% is, is it's, it's nothing. So I'm not sure how this got relevance and JAMA said, yeah, let's, let's publish it. That's, that's a problem. But then to cite it as good evidence to, you know, um, kibosh what we're trying to do with uh, SPTs. This makes no sense to me. This was a huge miss. And I, I feel like, you know, personally like attacked a little bit like this. There's research out there that could have been accessed and um, pretty good research uh, data that has been out there for some time. Some of you are on this um, <clears throat> uh, with us right now. Um, it's not hundreds and hundreds of studies, but uh, there is sufficient evidence out there now that could have been pointed to by these folks to say, oh, wait a minute, let's let's put, push the pause button, at least consider that there might be another viewpoint. Call the APTA and say, hey, guys, we're about to write this paper, this editorial saying we don't think you should do this. Do you have any evidence to to refute you know, our assumption? that apparently didn't happen. So again, end of the, the story was they got it through anyway. But if it happened in one state, could it happen in another? Could someone pull that letter out in another state and say, look, the ACR said no. And, and I'm giving you hopefully some tools if you're you know a part of advocacy efforts in your state to say, wait, 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 time out. That, that, that article's a joke <laughs> without maybe saying it's a joke, okay? So actual data. More data is always good, hence our study, all right? Ordering of diagnostic imaging by PTs, a multi-center analysis. Here's our purpose, pretty straightforward. 
report the utilization, appropriateness, appropriateness and reimbursement. Why these three things? This is what everybody wants to talk about. PTs are going to overutilize it for sure. They're going to order way too much stuff. Okay, maybe, maybe not. If they don't order too much, they're going to order the wrong stuff. Okay, maybe, maybe not. If those two things don't get you, maybe no one pays for it. All right. Maybe they or they don't order too much. Maybe they order the right stuff. But who cares if the bill doesn't get paid? These are legitimate concerns. Here's the nuts and bolts of our study. We had three institutions, four different states, 19 clinics, 53 PTs involved. The four states are listed here on the right. Georgetown is in Washington, D.C., covering Washington, D.C., of course, University of Wisconsin Hospital and Clinics, obviously in Wisconsin. And then Steve is, and his team cover uh the two states, Pennsylvania and New Jersey. Um, so that's why it's four states, three institutions. Here we go. Utilization rate, appropriateness, and reimbursement. We had nearly 300 imaging referrals that we looked at. 75% of them or so were x-rays and a quarter or so were advanced imaging. There you go. Utilization, utilization rate. What do we want this number to be? Before I show you, if, 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 if someone were to ask you, how often would you prefer uh, for people, for PTs to refer for diagnostic imaging studies? What do you want that to be? And it, I, I think the answer is it depends. If I work in a, in a sports injury direct access clinic, like Mike Kroll and those guys at West Point, the imaging use is going to be probably higher if I'm ruling out fractures every day, right? And, and it would need to be higher versus a different kind of clinic. So it depends, right? Here's what it was. Less than 1% of all of our patients in these three institutions, four different states, where PTs had imaging referral privileges were actually referred for imaging. Okay, That's for all patients across the board. We we're able to carve out just direct access patients at Georgetown alone. We weren't able to do that at St. Luke, St. Luke's in Wisconsin, unfortunately. The, the data wouldn't allow us to do that, but it jumped to 70% for direct access patients. And, and I, I like this story because it tells something ab about whether they have a referral or, or not. Maybe that impacts the, the, the decision about imaging as it should. If patients are seeing us off the street, there might be more of a chance for them to need imaging than if they've seen one or two or three other healthcare providers already. That just makes sense, okay? We don't want the 7% the to jump to 70% necessarily, but we wouldn't want it to be 0 0.1 either because what are we talking about, okay? Why was the utilization rate so low, right? Why is it less than 1%? Here's some thoughts that we had. Again, we weren't able to parse out direct access versus referred for all three institutions. My guess is if we were able to do that, we would see a similar pattern at the other two institutions. This, I think, is happening a fair amount. I think our whole team believes that this is happening. As um, people who are professional, we have great relationships with referring providers. Our physician colleagues are wonderful. We get on the phone and we say, I think this person might need an X-ray or an MRI. What do you think? And, and we that's kind of an old school approach for getting the, the MRI done or the X-ray done that, that can work just fine. And, and there's nothing wrong with that approach. And so we I think that until this becomes normative in PT practice, this second bullet point will probably happen uh, uh, for a while. Type of clinic I mentioned, if I work at a direct access clinic that sees acute sports injuries, my rates are going to go up. These three institutions, these are, are general, you know, outpatient ortho clinics that are seeing everything, okay? And then lastly, our, our thoughts are that, you know, a lot of PTs that practice in states that have imaging referral privileges don't know that they can refer for imaging. Dr. Mabry did a study on this a while back, and, and we showed that over 50% of PTs practicing in states that have authority to refer don't know that they can refer. So if PTs don't know, maybe patients don't know either, right? So if I'm a patient and I think I got a broken ankle, maybe my first choice isn't to go to a PT because I don't even know that they can order an x-ray. I'm going to go to the emergency room or somebody else because I don't know that they have the resources that, that I need, right? 
Our utilization rate is, is really appropriate, we'd say. It's, it's again, 1% for, for all patients, 7% for direct access patients. Let's move on to appropriateness. We didn't order over order, but maybe we ordered the wrong thing. How do you assess appropriateness? We chose to use the ACR appropriateness criteria. I won't go into detail on what these are. I think it's the gold standard. This is a uh, published um, decision-making algorithms based <clears throat> uh, published by uh, radiologists, not physical therapists. And so we followed these recommendations. Here we go. Here's how often we were appropriate. Uh, Georgetown at 93, University of Wisconsin at 86, and St. Luke's leading the way at 100%. Meaning overall institutional appropriateness for, for those 300 orders was 92%. This is a really good number, guys. It's not 100% across the board. This is an excellent number. I, I feel completely fine with it. Um, if you look at comparable um, papers, that look at utilization rates for imaging, especially like 20 years ago when imaging was just a disaster for you know, physicians overutilizing it. it. It could be 50%. In fact, it was for quite a while. And everybody said, hey, time out. We can't keep ordering MRIs for low back pain and that kind of stuff. So 92 is really, really solid. We didn't uh, overutilize. We ordered the right stuff. Did the bill get paid? Before we get into the details on reimbursement, as all of you probably are aware, it, it's not as, as easy as we want it to be just to say, yes, all the bills got paid or no, the bills didn't get paid. There's some nuances related to reimbursement that, that are tricky to understand. I'm gonna read this from our paper. Decisions related to covered services are unique to each patient's insurance plan. We all know that. Despite the significant diversity by company, state, geographic region and variation in policy. There's a lot of differences. The results of our study indicate no denials of claims for imaging services that were signed by physical therapists when routine pre-approval processes were followed by the imaging center. So what does that mean? We followed the same route that every other referring provider has to follow. Right? You write the order, you send it to the imaging center. The imaging center runs the authorization stuff. They, they see if the thing is in network or out of network. Every, every imaging center does this. Some insurance companies require goofy things, right? You have to fail physical therapy before you can get advanced imaging. What does that mean? Right? And, and whether I'm a physician ordering that MRI or, or a PT ordering that MRI, if that clause is in, in that person's insurance plan, it has to be followed. So that's what we did. We said, apply the rules that need to be applied for anybody referring for imaging. And there were no denial of claims when we did that. We're not aware of a single incident in which a patient was responsible for covering the cost of an imaging test as a result of a denied claim when a PT, not one. Okay. So that's, that's the real big question, right? Is if it gets denied and the, apart, the department has to absorb it, that's not great, but that's, that's less bad than you know, your aunt May having to pay $3,000 for the MRI that she never knew she, she, she was gonna have to pay for it. That didn't happen one time in our study. So just to summarize, Utilization rate was just under 1% for all patients, 7% for direct access, we were an A for appropriateness, and we had no denials for reimbursement. These, these are really good numbers. feel really good about this. Um, we did submit this for publication. We have not yet got a thumbs up on it yet. I'm kind of surprised by that. Um, I, I'm biased because I'm one of the authors, of course, but I, I've written worse things. I'll, I'll put it that way that have gotten published. So. <laughs> I thought this was going to be a slam dunk. I'm surprised that it's not in just yet, but we'll, we'll keep you guys all abreast of, of when it actually does find a home. So now we'll open it up. <clears throat> Thanks, Aaron. Uh, that's pretty impressive data. Uh, I, I mean, of course, you know, I, I want to, uh, 
I believe it because I know we're that judicious as a profession and we have the education. And I just wanted the, the one thing I wanted to, to comment on, uh, you brought up about that JAMA 2015 study uh, where they mentioned modest increase in imaging from uh, these advanced practices. I'm mean, really more appropriate is slight, I mean, just a razor thin margin uh, above what PCPs and physicians uh, order. So it's just, it's, it's astounding that this is supposed to be a peer reviewed study and that they would let them get away with that type of language. I mean, it's really self-serving, frankly. Um, it's tr And I, I would actually argue that it's transparently self-serving. So interestingly, just to cover that story just a little bit. So uh, Dr. Corey Zimney, who had to fend off that argument uh, from the ACR, uh, actually said, and this is a really good bit of uh, jujitsu, uh, linguistic lexical jujitsu. He essentially said, uh, so they wanted his comment on it. What do you think of this? Um, and of course, that uh, that that uh, article just conflates everybody, any sort of practitioner that's not a radiologist. But Corey actually just said, well, actually, we agree with it. Um, but they're just master's levels. They're master's level pro professions. We're doctoral level. We know how to do this. And we're not in that study. So he, he actually, uh, you know, with the relationships he forged within the legislature, he actually batted that away with, without a without difficulty. Now I'm not saying that every uh, every state will have that same uh, that same type of uh, uh, attitude to this document, but he was able to actually deal with it. He didn't shrink uh, from it, and he defended us very very well, and and essentially pulled out the ace of, uh, the uh, ace up our sleeve, which is the fact that we do have a doctoral level program. But wow, we've got to get ready to, as you said, uh, Aaron, we have to get ready to to deal with this type of objection. This was a really obnoxious, uh, obnoxious opinion on the part of the ACR. And uh, frankly, I addressed this with doctor, with uh, with uh, APT of Government Affairs who are supposed to raise this issue with uh, the ACR, um, um, with Justin Elliott. So uh, this, is, this is very much still in play. Bill, you had a question and a hand raised. I do. Thank you. And first of all, congrats to the uh, to the authors. Great project. And of course, love the data um, as well. Um, question I have regarding the utilization rate. Um, it looks like there was an overutilization, but any chance there could have been underutilization? Did you review any charts where PTs did not refer a patient to imaging to make sure that was the right decision? Great question. I'll open it up for the team. Anybody want to chime in? Scott, Steve, Evan, Kelly. <clears throat> uh, yeah, I can. For our data, I I did not see any um, direct underutilization. Under the other than um, when you see providers word of mouth referring back to the uh, PCP. So I, I guess if you'd count that way, that there's some underutilization. So the P, the PT is maybe just telling the doctor to order the film and they get it. You know, I guess if you'd count that, but otherwise I haven't done chart reviews where patients never got the films that they needed. There, there in our data set, there was a number of uh, people that uh, a couple forgot that they had ordering rights. Um, and a couple uh, just felt uh, with the patient in mind, they felt more comfortable talking with the physician first. And um, in a couple cases, they were going to order it and the physician ordered it first. So Bill, one, one of the things that I think has sort of generalizable knowledge here is that we did observe in the data that we had a level of self-efficacy build and so there were a number of people that ordered once or maybe twice, but then there weren't very many people that ordered three or four times. It quickly jumped so that the, a small set of people ordered repeatedly and frequently. So there's high concern as we teach our colleagues to do this, high concern of that they won't do it correctly and they won't do it well and will be a disservice to the patient or they'll do it wrong and have to do kind of other work uh, to correct their errors. And the steps can be a little bit, the steps are an implementation barrier to learn which buttons to push and 
what steps to follow, both in your EMR, but also in the next step care coordination thing so that you appropriately give a handoff. So this person presents at the radiology department to get the right image uh, at the right time. And we saw that those things started to erode after about referral number three. And then also when they were surrounded by colleagues who were also higher, more frequent utilizers, there was like a microcosm community of practice where they supported each other. And so there were user groups inside clinics or at clinics that would self-promote the engagement in the process. And that seemed to lead to more utilization where the first couple of trips, it was a high hesitancy experience for the referring physical therapist. You know, I could just add, I think, I mean, clearly we don't want to overutilize. We want to order appropriately. But I've heard some arguments in the past that, well, PTs, they don't know when the, they don't, they can't screen at a high enough level to recognize all those who truly need imaging. So I think if we can show data where PTs did not refer a patient for imaging and that was the right decision, that would also be a powerful message to add to, for example, the data that you have. Is that something you address as well, um, Evan? I like that approach um, and that, that counterpoint. Um, knowing when things weren't done when you're doing an EHR search is a really hard data poll when you're, when you're asking for something that can't be found. But I really like that consideration of hypothetically a random chart audit right. and whether the decision-making in that random chart audit was appropriate or not. Yeah. And, an example, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm hogging the time here, but an example where that was helpful, when we piloted the direct access program at UW Hospital in Madison, including ordering uh, imaging, for the four PTs who were part of the pilot, we had charts randomly pulled. And there was a physician and a PT who did the chart review and so they looked at, you know, if we ordered imaging, was uh, playing field, was that the appropriate decision to make? And also looked at, was it reimbursed or not? But they also looked at, if I didn't order imaging, was that the correct decision uh, to be made? And thankfully, we had a good report card, and that led to a thumbs up to go beyond the pilot and, and adopt the program fully. I'm curious, Dr. Clark, I, we haven't heard from you yet, so you're going to be on the hot seat right now. Uh, I'm wondering, do you have any cases where, okay, something happened to me where the patient just absolutely insisted is that this patient was doing fine, uh, improving, uh, sciatica nerve root involvement was getting much less involved, a lot less radiation, some, uh, some exacerbations here and there, but he absolutely wanted to have an MRI. I'd like to have an MRI. I just want to know. I just want to know. Do you have any, <laughs> did you get any ha physical therapist handcuffed? Uh, by patients that absolutely insisted on it. And uh, what do you do about that sort of thing? Did you guys uh, uh, at all uh, cross that circumstance? Um, I would say we all have some patients who, no matter what you say or what you do, that they're definitely going to want an MRI, no matter how much that you educate them on, you know, it might not actually be in line with what their symptoms are. Um, I, can't, I can't think of a specific incidence where, anyone felt really pressured because of that to order an image. Um, the only time that I can really think of, and I can actually think of an incident last week when we did order an MRI of the pelvis um, was because someone was, exp was displaying more of the red flag symptoms. Um, they might've had a CT done of the pelvis, but they had ongoing unrelenting low back pain for the past. I think actually the therapist who wanted to order the image is on this webinar. So if they want to um, speak up at any point, but um, it was a thing about four or six weeks of care. Um, really nothing that was doing treatment wise was changing. Um, like a positive sign of the buttock, long-term use of corticosteroids. That's when we utilized getting more of an MRI of the low back or of the pelvis, sorry. Just for concern of, um, I think sacral insufficiency was the therapist's reasoning. 
Yeah. So I can really only think of incidences like that when we're going to look to order an MRI, but that's only after we're looking at the uh, ACR guidelines of as everything else that's been in line appropriately imaged before um, and to help us rule out that suspicion. But I can't say we'd ever go straight to ordering an MRI of, of the lumbar spine because someone would really like it. <laughs> I'll, I'll chime in real quick. I, I have had patients over the years push for an MRI and, you know, probably all of us at some point have, have had that. And before I could order, it was easy to go, oh, I'm sorry, I can't order, you know, ask your doc. <laughs> but, but now that I could, it, it becomes a different conversation. So I would typically respond with, if it was low back pain, with something like that could be a very appropriate test to order at some point. Um, I'm if you're considering, that. if you're considering surgery and that usually gets people attention, then, then that might be appropriate. Um, I'm not opposed to that. I try to teach our residents this. Don't don't put the wall up immediately. Um, do your physical exam, impress them with your knowledge, show them that you care, and then they might be a little bit more open to you saying no or not yet for, for imaging. Um, that's how I've handled those myself. <clears throat> I really like that. That's really practical. And that's, that's a line I've gone on. You know, there's no indication, no present danger. There's nothing that's going to change your your uh, therapeutic trajectory uh, by having this imaging right now. We're doing what we sh we should do. Um, the uh, so thanks for that. I think that's really really important. Um, anybody else have anything? I I basically say very similar things to what uh, Dr. Kyle just mentioned. Um, I have had a couple patients who have insisted um, and. I've been able to show them with their physical exam and their history that it may not have been necessary. And then in some cases they came in saying, I need an MRI and I agreed with them. They did. <laughs> and we ordered it. Right. Well, what's interesting about this whole, okay. Our, our, you know, we talk about utilization, uh, inappropriate utilization, overutilization, underutilization. I mean, this is uh, one of, one of our panelists I'm sure has mentioned this before, but you know, we're a deliberate, <laughs> Profession. We do do physical exams. We assess, we get a history. And we're not one to actually jump to the assessment, whereas physicians, primary care physicians, will actually use imaging as their primary line of evaluation. Um, and uh, I'm just wondering if anybody can speak to that. And, you know, if there's actually this built in restraint that physical therapists have, we uh, that's actually explained in your paper. I'm hoping that. A little bit of that is is talked about. Maybe it isn't. Uh, but uh, does anybody have any comment on that? I've got uh, a theory on it. Um, I, I think, in my mind, it comes down to the tools that we have. And as physical therapists, we have treatments that we provide to the patients and show them we can change their symptoms. And I think some of these other practitioners that utilize imaging, they use it to help get consults in place to advanced uh, surgeons or what it may be. Um, and then they can prescribe medicine. So certain providers use the tools they have. And I just think physical therapists, we have the tools to show we can change symptoms without imaging. When I think some of these other providers just don't, don't have that available. I, I mean, that's my kind of short take on it. Are you commenting on that type of? Uh, are you are you making a? Are you drawing conclusions in your paper just as a sneak peek or? No, well, <laughs> that that is not in the paper. But yeah. I, you know, I think it's an interesting standpoint in that no matter what clinician you are, or a physician you are, you you have the tools you have, and I I think we're finding physical therapists more in especially now less opiates, right? Try and get PTs in the ED. And, and I think if you can show a patient you can change their symptoms without that, then I think for me, that calms my patients down for the need of further imaging. Uh, uh, regarding the reluctance though, Bruno, as, as you were saying, are, are PTs kind of hesitant or are they gun shy? In my experience, I think that is, is, is more often true than, than it's not. And, and in a good way, they're, they're, they haven't done this before and they don't want to get it wrong and they want to be judicious and they they're they're super conscientious about ethics and you know not that other providers aren't but 
I feel like what, like Evan was saying, once they get into the, oh, I can do this and I can make good choices and things turn out okay, then it's over. It, it's fine. But that initial hurdle, I remember the first x-ray I ever ordered after learning all this stuff from Bill. And I was freaking out. Like, oh my gosh, this is going to be the wrong thing. I don't know what I'm doing. And I had to get over that and just go, no, it's it's okay. So. <clears throat> yeah, I think, but I think that's a great thing about our profession. We do keep ourselves in check. I mean, sometimes I just think we really cripple ourselves a bit with that. But I think really we do hold ourselves to a really high standard. I think this is part of our culture. I think this is something we should, I mean, it was something, I, you know, we don't need to completely jettison. I think we need a little more, uh, we need to be a little more self-assured and realize that we're going to get there. Uh, and, uh, but you're, you're right. But I think, you know, this is, this is, these are one of the, the, the ethical features of our profession. So I'm going to say that's a real positive. I appreciate you sharing that. Rita Shapiro, you got your hand raised. Hi, Bruno. Yes. Thank you. Um, I, I agree with you 100% about, um, you know, the primary care physicians utilizing imaging as their primary mode of, uh, diagnosis whereas that they kind of tend to uh, refrain from actual clinical examination, that they're concentrating more on symptomatology rather than actually examining the patient. And they're like, oh, okay, let me order an MRI. What MRI are you ordering? For what purpose? Are you actually looking at something, what the outcome will be? Or are you projecting that there is going to be a surgical intervention or, or an injectable intervention, but, they, but they're not able to even comprehend that. Whereas we, physical therapists, who are kind of trained, in, you know, specialists, if you will, we can determine those differences, whereas they cannot. And primary, if you look at the studies, primary care are the ones who are utilizing imaging and specialized imaging far more than physical therapists are. I mean, I can tell you from, from the military perspective, mm -hmm. we, we never utilize, um, you know, higher level of imaging unless it is absolutely necessary. What's your background, Rita? Oh, I'm, I'm a Navy PT and uh, transferred into uh, public health, but practiced with the Navy all my 28 years. Well, Aaron, you're, uh, you're part of that pedigree, aren't you, of some of us? Do you have anything to add to what Rita just talked about? I thank you, Rita, for the the commentary. Yeah, you're you're preaching to the choir. I think everybody here kind of gets that. And um, just just a word of caution is is um, it's easy to uh, you know make this into a turf war that it doesn't need to be. I don't think. Um, I try to tell our residents and our students just do your job well, and and. Don't think so much about other professions, you know, uh, do what no, I, I agree with you, Aaron. Yeah, I'm not trying to make it a turf war, but what I'm trying to uh, emphasize is, is that uh, we need to utilize our knowledge to educate the legislature to allow us to order imaging and we can present the facts rather than a turf war scenario. Yeah, well put. Very well put. I'm going to add to that uh, just just on the on the side of we need to educate our legislators. The legislators, uh, we need to educate our state board members. Uh, it's not only them, so we don't have to always ask the legislature to actually uh, do a, a ask and plead. There are other approaches we can do. Ultimately, yes, we'll probably have to prepare for a you know uh, to to the max uh, on certain legislative initiatives but just fyi for people listening in there are other ways we can do this uh as well so uh, but there's plenty of people on from the inside of our profession doesn't real uh, that don't realize that uh, we have certain gifts of our education uh, given to us uh, uh because of our education and that we really uh do handle imaging referral in a different way from other physicians and that might actually we have to suspend our disbelief that it actually might be really much better in terms of the musculoskeletal realm? Or do I speak out of turn, Evan Nelson? I, 
I just want to add. To feel free to counterpoint. I mean, you know. No, I, I just want to add that um, uh, Pennsylvania is a silent state. So I want to just make it very clear to everybody. Um, New Jersey is a green state uh, on your map, but Pennsylvania is a silent state. So we worked because our state board is not allowed to provide an opinion uh, per the governor. Um, we worked with our legal team to make sure that we were not stepping on any toes and we started ordering. Right. Any other questions for our panelists? Any panelists wanna air out something? <laughs> You're sure, okay. Well, going off of what Steve just said, I think that's the real power in this story. And as far as like the tightness of the research methods, there are certain things that they could be more robust in this study like most. And this is a very real world study. So the benefit of that is we have four different state realities of jurisdictional practice, three different organizations for their organizational risk tolerance and beliefs and policy and procedures. And then we have almost a, like so many physical therapists that engaged with this process and their individual practice uh, behaviors, training pedigrees, years of experience, all of those things. And nearly 300 instances with all the different uh, insurance payers that go along with those in those different geographic markets. Like that's the real power in this is that we've done this and now combined everything from these very different realities and on these key important points of how often is it utilized? Was it appropriate? And did we get paid? There are no red flag warning signs. When we did this in every day, fairly regular practice by people who are just living their clinical lives, treating patients, trying to make the right decisions and help people get better. And I think that's the power in this story is that it's, it's data that came from real practice from a lot of places. And when we combined it, we found good things. Very well stated, thank you. That's great. Um... I am deeply appreciative of our panelists, uh, Drs. Aaron, Kyle, Stephen Correa, Kelly, Clark, Evan Nelson, Scott Toppiner, uh, in absentia, Brian Barney. Uh, thanks so much for joining in. Bill Boyce and I'll, Rita Shapiro, appreciate the insights, Annette Curran, uh, Tara Fredrickson, who always works in the background, always just really makes this thing happen. Uh, so happy, so grateful. And Bill Boyce and all, once again, thank you so much for joining and providing such perspectives and insights. This is incredibly valuable research. I really can't wait to, to, to read the article um, just uh, with bated breath and crossing fingers and eyes and whatever. Uh, so keep working at it and uh, keep doing the good work. And uh, hopefully we'll see you at the next meeting on uh, May 23rd with Tim Flynn. Um, if not, you know, it's gonna be uh, on our YouTube channel and or uh, and definitely on our uh, AOPT website so and web page so really appreciate it folks uh i know you're all very very busy uh we'll call it for now and uh